Welcome everyone to another episode of Black Metal Legends. Uh, we have Cyberman of 1349 and as you guys know 1349 is like my favorite band of all time so it's really really exciting to get um, another member. Uh, well we had Shalva who was in the band before and now we've got Cyberman here so really really excited to talk to um, Cyberman here about all things 1349. He was also in Pantheon Eye, he's got his own project uh, Svart Lotus. And he's also in Mortem as well. So there's lots of experience that he's had in the music industry. And he's also primarily a bass player. And um, we haven't had a bass player yet on Black Metal Legends. And I'd really like to share some more light on bass playing and black metal. So, Siderman, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thanks. It's nice to be here. I want to start off um, by asking. So let, let's start from like right from the beginning uh what got you into playing playing bass and what made you want to start being a musician well uh, the thing was uh my parents were um, um yeah well my parents were they weren't musicians but they were you know like everyone else in the 60s and 70s they had acoustic guitars and they sang and my brother sings still he sings beautifully actually i don't um, and, you know, there was always an acoustic guitar and a piano and, for some reason, an accordion, which was my lot in life at a young age. I do not wish to speak about that. Um, but as it were, after the accordion and the piano lessons, um, uh, I had, um, around 35 years ago, um, been hanging around in uh, uh, rehearsal rooms with my friends, you know, the cool friends who were in bands. At one point in the rehearsal room, someone just hey, to pick up the pick up the bass. You can play the bass. And I was like, how how do I play the bass? I just just look at the guitarist and you know, move your fingers around and see what happens. And that was the start of it. And uh, I was terrible at it, of course, <laughs> like everyone else who starts out. I was terrible at it, but um, I liked it. It, it. it it felt good to to play the bass. It it appealed to something in me the the low frequent kind of rumbling shit. That was uh, that felt nice. And um, you know, we we were kids. We were eleven, twelve, thirteen at this time. So we were playing no punk. We we didn't know how to play anything else. We played punk. Um, but. Um, after a while, I, was like, I, I like the bass. The bass, the ba the bass I can do. This, this is me. Because bass players could, you know, be on the sideline and you you fiddle with your own stuff. I was in a band for a while with three guitarists, so I think it took about a year before I actually heard myself playing anything because there was just you know three guitars turned up louder, louder, louder. So I was wondering what was going on in the back, but um. All this is, of course, childhood shit. Uh, it has very little to do with me, kind of, <laughs> what came after, apart that it was a beginning. Um, because as we get closer to 1991, 92, um, I mean, I grew up in the 80s, like a lot of other kids, so heavy metal was everywhere, luckily. So it was Iron Maiden, it was Judas Priest, it was, um, yeah. Halloween, it was all the 80s, you know, big hair, squeaky voices, double kick drums, you know, metal, of course. And um, my parents, of course, hated all that. They were listening to Beatles, Bob Marley, Pink Floyds, uh, classical music, folk music, a lot of that. And I was in my basement listening to whatever I was listening to at the time, most likely Commodore 64 bleep music. And I had an older brother and he got cassettes with, you know, interesting covers like Iron Maiden. I saw the cover for Killers and I was like, oh, this is cool. Based on the cover, I was going to listen to this. And, you know, 70s rock, uh, and all this Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, all that stuff my older brother listened to. So I kind of just grabbed everything because I realized that I loved music. It, it did the genre was never really important. It was the fact that it was music. But uh, as the kind of eighties made their way into the nineties, I discovered that there was other stuff out there. It wasn't just you know there was 
the hair metal, but there was stranger stuff, more evil stuff. There was, um, I became a death metal kid in the very late 80s. I discovered, hey, what the fuck, Morbid Angel? What is this? Obituary? How can they do that shit? I mean, Guilty Frost, all these things, kind of late 80s, early 90s, I started discovering that, and I was like, whoa, this is cool. But um, I can't remember if it's 92 or 93, because memory is, it, those times are a bit woozy. Um, I got this black cassette with someone had written in, you know, it was tape trading, we were all, you know, we didn't have original stuff, we were kids, we had tapes. And it just said Burtzum on it, and I was like, what the fuck is this, let's check it out. And, I mean, I had no fucking clue what was going on, that, those vocals. I mean, one thing was, was all the death metal shit that I understood, hey, I can do this, is just pushing it, but, but Burtzum, I was like, how the fuck does he do that? And I hated it. I was like, this is the worst shit I've ever heard, but I can't stop listening. So every day after school, I would come home and do my homework and put and listen to Gursum. Day after day after day, and I still can't do those vocals, but, but, but I started to kind of, there was something about the music that drew me in, and I, I had to do this. this. There's no, there was this feeling of home, that this this is this is where I belong somehow in this weird um, beautiful but very ugly music very harsh dissonant stuff I was like this yeah this is this can be home and uh, luckily then I met um, uh, the vocalist of Thirteen Forty Nine who was back then a drummer and we met at a friend's house who was a guitarist uh, while we were watching Woodstock 93 or something ridiculous on TV. Some, some bullshit on MTV. And uh, I think I was wearing a Sepultura t-shirt and he was wearing uh, something else and we looked at each other like, yeah, here's, here's, here's people who know what's what. And um, for some reason we just kind of started jamming. I mean, he played drums and did vocals and I played bass and guitar and we kind of, I couldn't play guitar back then, fuck no, but I could play bass. So, so we just did stuff that was this first band, this off thing in Mirkra, which did absolutely nothing, nothing at all. There's some demo tapes from a barn with us making noise and some cows in the background, but that tape will never see the light of day. Um, but, but that was it, that was the seed, um, because he kind of, we, we played together for, for a while, I was doing, back then also, I was doing shitloads of other bands, I was, you know, like every kid learning, you were doing cover songs with your friends, uh, and just like Shalva, I did a lot of grunge, um, you know, stuff like that, I, I, I still really love Alice in Chains. Soundgarden uh, and some of that stuff, but yeah, we were playing lots of lots of learning, learning stuff and playing stuff, and I hated learning other people's shit, which I think is why I play a lot of the stuff I do because I was terrible at learning other people's shit. So I'm like, no, fuck this, I'm gonna play my own shit and let's see what happens. As it were, uh, then uh, Raven moved to Oslo, the capital. He's uh, a couple of years older than me, so he went there and I was still at home and still still in school, still doing weird fucking black metal demos uh, without a drummer, so I just sat with a keyboard and just, you know, did drums like that, which sounded terrible, and tried to make as much music as I possibly could. And then as soon as I was done with school, I took one year in a different school, learning folk music, don't ask me why, but I did, and I'm happy I did it, but, um, um, you know, I was one year in a music school learning folk music and jamming with shitloads of people I would never have met otherwise, including some weird guys from Hödefoss who introduced me to Krog, proper 70s Krog and all this weirdness that came after, so at one point I realized, hey, I can 
I can actually do complicated shit. How did that happen? But as soon as that was over, then I moved directly to Oslo, and uh, at that time already, um, the Raven was in the band with Chalve. And if I remember correctly, Chalve's girlfriend at the time, who was singing or screaming in this black metal band, and some guitarists, no bass player. So I stepped in there. And then very quickly after I moved to um, Oslo, then Raven decided that I'm going to fire everyone and set for Chalve, and then he's going to bring in me, and then we're going to do 1349. He had kind of figured out the name, and okay, now it's 1349. And we had one more guitarist for the first demo, whose name eludes me at the moment, but um, he didn't last through the demo, so he was out. And then it was me, Raven, and Chalve for the for the first, second demo. And the thing about those early days is that we lived in the rehearsal room. I went to work, I went home, and I went straight to the rehearsal room, and we rehearsed because we were going to be, you know, brutal. We're going to be better than everyone else. We're going to be most crazy fucking black metal shit out there. So, so we lived in the rehearsal room, and then in the weekends, of course, we got shit faced. And then we went back to the rehearsal room. And um, after you know a year or so of that, we were like, okay, now now things are things are picking up. Things things are getting good. Now we should maybe you know maybe we should do shows. Maybe we should you know play live and. And the drummer and what happened was, of course, like, how am I going to do drums and sing at the same time? That's... And he wasn't so keen on that, so we were like, ah, yeah, maybe we need another guitarist. So we did one thing at a time, and um, there was this drummer we tried at one point. He didn't really work out, but uh, he had this buddy from the same village uh, who was a good guitarist, so maybe we wanted to talk to him. And that was Archeon, and I met him at Elm Street, this pub in Oslo where all the metal people were hanging for a while. And um, we got along really well, and I was like, okay, come to the rehearsal room and show me what you got. And um, he, he had it, <laughs> it and more. And uh, then they started, you know, kicking it up a notch, and uh, we started to record a mini CD back in 2000, I think. At the time, we were sharing a rehearsal space with Satyricon. And uh, Frost would all, always come to us in rehearsal and play the Hell Riff, which was a riff from Hybrid Spears. <laughs> Oh, oh, this one, this one. I, I know. Hang on, hang on. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the bass part is um, is uh, is uh, yeah. You play you play the guitar part because the bass part is harmony to the actual riff. So. That's epic. Uh, I stole that from. Uh, you scold the place in Arcturus and uh, Ulver and all that stuff. That's a really, really cool writing technique um, as well. Like you've got the, because that's the thing with the, with the, with the bass. So um, going like, yeah, just moving on a, like, I guess a music theory and writing standpoint, because when you're, when you've got a guitar, mm -hmm. uh, the guitar players, you know, playing, you know, an E, an E's then C's and E flats. Like normally a bass player will just play the root notes, but I love that you've, you've, uh, you're playing the fifths as well mm. and that way it just makes the bass sing a bit more because it's just mm. in that higher register but it still works it's a that's brilliant i love that i had no yeah, idea I, I had the four string at the time uh, back in those days i was still playing uh, this uh, warwick thumb four string uh, i played that up until and including beyond the apocalypse was recorded with that after that it was the vampire Five but yeah, um, yeah, but yeah, that that riff, I know, is that that was the hell riff, as Frost used to say, and they really loved that. So at some point, we just asked, "Hey, would you be interested in just doing the drums for a demo?" Because 
things are escalating and Raven was destroyed, he would keep up with it. So, yeah, he, he said yes, and then that happened, and um, we don't, I think she also kind of covered most of this history anyway, so I don't have to repeat all that, but uh, suddenly there's this point in my life where I'm playing with musicians that are ridiculously much better than me. And I, I realized that, okay, it's either shape up or shape out. It, there's no, when you have Archeon on one hand and you have Frost there, and then, okay, now <laughs> I'm to bring in the A game. And, and um, we were still, you know, living in the rehearsal room, of course, rehearsing shitloads, and it was this very creative time where we all, you know, brought riffs and we all wanted to, you know, do proper black metal and do it as extreme as possible and kind of push it over up, up, up and over the edge and beyond the apocalypse, yes, and then eventually Hellfire. Um, and I think at some point you were asking Jolv about the Hellfire guitar sound. Yes. And yes. Um, the, the, that's a PV triple X that I have in my basement somewhere. Through my Ampeg 410 with a tweeter. <laughs> so that's a guitar head driven through a bass amp. For the Hellfire guitar tone? Yes. Oh, that's dang <laughs> Yeah, hell yeah. That's that's awesome. So triple X with a... Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, no, I had this 4x10 or 4x12 cabinet with a tweeter and we drove the... Um, First we tried driving through my 18-inch sub, but that didn't do anything, but then through the tweet it had this hellfire sound, so um, that's that. We, we get a bit ahead of ourselves, I guess, but um, but yeah, that's, um, I was always a bit shitty with amps, I mean I had an Ampeg, and I still have an Ampeg somewhere, but um, yeah, have you ever lugged um, 8 by 10 Ampeg classic through <laughs> through Europe for an extended period of time. You don't want to do that for a very long time. So uh, we were blessed, I would say blessed, that uh, Celtic Frost brought us on their US tour back in 2006, first time we went there. And I mean, that's a fucking honor right there, and I'm super grateful for that, but also Martin, um, the bass player, he took me aside like, buddy, you can do things the really hard way for yourself, but this is a sand samp, and the sand samp will be your friend, and the sound guys will love you. So I went to Guitar Center and I bought one, and uh, yeah, no, that stayed with me until a couple of years ago when I discovered Dark Glass, and then I realized that, okay, this is again the kind of pro level Pro level shit, but back then we're talking, you know, Hellfire early, early 349 days. It was um, my uh, Warwick thumb straight into a um, yellow boss OD pedal, I think. No, wait, actually for liberation. Mm -hmm. That's just my bass straight into the mixing table. There's no, there's nothing. I didn't use distortion. If we were ever going to remaster um, liberation, we would put fuss on the end of uh, satanic propaganda, where it's just the bass. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, I would put distortion there. Otherwise, that album's perfect and it doesn't need any anything else. But that would have been great. But after that, I got a um, big muff. This, you know, this very doom metal pedal for the bass, and I used that until I got the sand sand, and then. Things kind of snowballed, and now I'm lazy, and I just have a pedal board with a dark glass, and that's all I'll ever need for live play. But um, but yeah, uh, I think I got lost in gear there for a while, but we can try to cycle back to wherever the fuck we were. Early days of 349, um, and you just have to stop me if I ramble and <laughs> no, no, it's brilliant. Stare, stare me in, into the right direction. No, um, no. It's all good, um, because because that, there's a few points that I wanted to mention in there that are really, really important, I think, for a lot of people. And it's when you were saying you were playing with a whole bunch, with, with a lot of musicians, a lot of different musicians as well. Because 
it's it was it's kind of similar to my story and the way I got more into music is because you know I was just a kid and my friend um, played guitar and I thought okay that's kind of cool let me try as well and I'd always wanted to like learn guitar at some point so I was like okay cool I like music I started learning guitar and then you just play guitar and then you meet other musician friends you start playing with them and then it just kind of snowballs and then exactly like how you did just played covers played other people's songs and it got to a point where I couldn't play some band songs or whatever and then you, you keep on learning more songs and keep on playing with people and then your playing just slowly starts escalating escalating and then you get to a point where you can you realize you're playing more difficult songs and then you realize your playing goes a bit higher like this and then it and then exactly like you said before when you meet some really really good musicians and you start playing with them it's kind of like you've got to up your fucking game like properly because it's it's so difficult to keep it's difficult to keep up and it's so difficult to play but the the it's the sad thing now i think in the modern age of guitar players and writing now is that it's becoming a lot more cause the thing is it's easier for people to write by themselves now and uh do things at home because you know if we take this like this laptop i'm using for example i've got logic which has got you know inbuilt drum kits i've got like a bass guitar here i've got a guitar here i've got an interface and, and an amp so i can i can make songs you know just by myself and you know of course that's fine but i i, I find more nowadays that i want to write with more people and work with more people in in projects because it's so much more fun and you can share more ideas and you can push uh, you can people can push each other to try and take it up to that next level and that's one of the that's one of the best things about 1349 and, and one of the reasons why why i think i'm drawn to the band so much is because there's always that sense of like no we've got to do this better do this better do this better do this better more 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 and it's this kind of like it's almost like a a really aggressive self-development journey in 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 a black metal way like it's always about trying to push things to the next level yeah and i love that because you you get the most the things that make the difference are things that are different and it sounds like really obvious but it's like people need to like try and do something in a different way for a different result of course and that's what i love about 1349 it's it, it it's just it's its own take on black metal that has all of like it has all of the cool slayer and 80s style of um riffs in the writing like if we take um like if we take dodds camp for example that's almost got like a like an almost like a Jimi hendrix style of intro like a van almost like a van halen kind of thing just kind of like it, just, it has it has the glam rock trappings that our guitarist also loves very much. Yes, there's a quite a bit of all that, but um, it's all good. Yeah. The and thing is, uh, I think this is a right moment to interject something about uh, this com very common misconception. It seems for me as an outsider looking at music today. Hmm. I mean, uh, 1349 were, of course, and still are to a certain degree traditionalists, if you can call it that. Um, that we wanted black metal to sound a certain way and all that shit. However, we did not want to sound exactly like Dark Throne around Transylvanian Hunger, because that's Dark Throne. The beauty of the early 90s black metal bands is that they are all black metal, undoubtedly. However, they don't sound alike. They all have identities. Yes. That's, that's what I, when I listen to a lot of stuff, of course, let's be honest, the tape trading days are gone and the internet is kind of a swamp. So I don't get to hear as much as I would like to, even though I'm, I'm sure there is good stuff out there. You just have to wade through. Hmm. A lot of stuff I get presented is technically adept. Uh, usually, I mean, the, the levels, the skill levels, I mean, 12 year olds are doing, you know, gravity blasts and all that shit. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you guys are way out there, but the identity is, um, I can take this moment to, uh, 
with Smart Lotus, where I play the guitar and I occasionally make vocal noise. Um, a lot of people have, through the time that band has existed, come to me like, but this does not sound like 1349 at all. I'm like, no, it sounds like Smart Lotus, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Like, yeah, that's the point. I already have a band that sounds like 1349, so why the fuck would I want another one? I mean, identity, that's the, that's the key to proper black metal or proper music of any sort, is that it has a voice of its own, it has something that kind of resonates with something in you, and there's stuff out there that I hear where I think that you are competent, but I don't feel you. Mm. And when I don't feel you, I lose interest very, 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 very quick. Um, but yeah, that was the tangent again, and I'm sorry. Back to you. No, I agree. I agree entirely because it's um, it's it's very easy for a um, a person who's new to music or or yeah, new to anything, and then they find their <laughs> their idol or their icon. And they kind of gravitate towards that, like, um, admittedly. So this is a Dean V Razorback. And one of the reasons why I got this is because I was a 16-year-old kid who saw 1349 at the Underworld in, like, October or November in 2011. Hey. And Kaon had his uh, black... <laughs> yeah, 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 he had the Dean Razorback, Razorback. Yeah, Black Razorback with the EMGs. And that was... That is still the most um that that's the one of the most life-changing experiences of my life like that was like holy shit like mm -hmm. this is how fucking good i need to be and how good my band needs to be that really set like a super high bar and then i, I kind of gravitated to this <laughs> to this kind of like 1349 worship because you know i <laughs> i got the guitar i got the sound you know i, I wanted to try and I wanted the revelations of the Black Flame guitar tone and the Demon Wath sound, and I wanted to play like Archaeon. But then I realized it's like, okay, I can do all of this, but if but I'm never going to sound like Archaeon. I'm never going to sound like 1349. Even even if I learn all the songs and work out all they are, you know, sh the way Shalva and Archaeon and you and Ra Raven and Frost and how everyone writes is always going to be different to me. And then when I realized that, that's when I was like, okay, I shouldn't, okay, I can be inspired by people, but I shouldn't, but, I, I, but I'm never going to be able to play like them. I, I could, like, technically, yeah, I can play, you know, or you can get yourself to that kind of standard. But when it comes to, like, your own art, it needs to be exactly like you said, it has to have that identity, and it has to have, like, that real piece of your heart mm. in the music. And that's, that's the thing that really, really stuck out. And exactly like you said, all of the early uh, black metal stuff um, is so iconic you know all of all of the early stuff has its own sound you know Burzum had its own sound thorns oh, and yeah. that's what made everything special um enslaved emperor um everyone had their own sound and i think that's so important now uh mm -hmm. trying to get that piece of you into the music rather than you trying to sound like your favorite band because it's so easy to do that it's so easy to get it's so easy for like a Slayer fan to be like, yeah, I want to sound like Slayer. <laughs> and it's easy for a, you know, a, a, a 16 year old Dev Gohill to be like, hey, I want to be 1349 for fuck's sake. But I realized like, it's not going to happen. Um, I'm always going to be me and I'm always going to be different to them. So I've got to try and embrace that and make my own music more of myself rather than, you know, the, the, the 1349 stuff, I guess. <laughs> but it's, it's, a really it's a really important point. Yeah, no, but it's, it's, um, I mean, we all have idols. Um, I, I spent a lot of time as a kid um, because I was in love with Primus. So I did this. All that shit. But then I was like, so where the fuck am I going to use that? Yeah. Where, where am I going to do the punk, punk slap, a little, little, little shit? And then I just stopped because I realized um, I can maybe practice up to a level where I am less Claypool-ish. Mm. But 
I am not less playful and I will never kind of, I will just be a bleak copy. And it's maybe more interesting for me to know what, what is Sidemon, what's inside this head, what, what can I bring out to the world. And uh, of course also my father had this um, sayings, he was a man of sayings, he had a lot of sayings always for some reason. And he says, uh, there's a billion people out there playing this and many of them are better than you, a lot of them are probably worse than you, but you are the only one that plays exactly like you. And this is a very pedagogical teacher parent thing to say, so of course he said that. But it's also unfortunately true. And unless you kind of sit down and think, but what do I want to express and what, what is in here? Then you're always going to be this copy of, of someone else and that's I mean, for many, that's, that's great. I mean, a lot of very talented musicians I know, you know, they have work, they have jobs, and then if, at weekends they have, you know, their Toto cover band or Led Zeppelin cover band, where they do a very, very good rendition of someone else's shit. They have perfected it, so they, you know, and that's fantastic. But for me, it's always, but I don't want to be a copy machine. I, I, I want to create something own that's 20, 30, 40 years down the line. Some idiot is going to be like, I want to play those songs. Hey, guys, let's get, get to rehearse room and crank out some 1349 tunes, right? <laughs> I don't see that happening really, but, but who knows? The, the future yeah. is in a weird place. Yeah, see, I'm one of those, I'm one of those, like, hyper fans that would actually do that. Like, if I could find, like, a few people who would actually want to cover 1349 songs, I'd be down for that shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those guys, man. But <laughs> All right, good, good, good to know. <laughs> yeah, but, but at the same time, um, going, one thing that you mentioned, which was um, one thing that really st stood out to me, which was you didn't want to play other people's songs. And I found that so, uh, that was, I got to that point as well. It was like, all right, I'm learning all these songs, but what about like my own songs? And then it was kind of like that made me like, I, there was a time where I didn't like practice, practice guitar and only wrote music mm. for about like five or six years um, because that was the only thing that I really wanted to do, uh, you know, with my bands at the time, you know, I wrote like loads and loads of songs. And, but that's, but then I think songwriting is such an important skill as mm. well as the playing because it's, because it's it's hard because a so a song is you know you can say a song is a collection of riffs but it's more a case of like a journey and a story it's, um, it's very easy for a song to be one dimensional mm. and um, in some ways it works but what I what I love in in uh, music as well is like all the twists and turns you know, people say it's progressive, um, but I, I don't know if I entirely agree with that. I think it's more, I think a journey is a better way of describing it. And because, um, I don't know, progressive seems like one of those like pseudo terms uh, in a way, because it's kind of like, what does progressive actually mean sometimes? Like, does it mean like you're playing in some odd time signatures or you're just doing something a bit differently? Or is it just because someone's writing in a different way? Like it. I don't know, when people say something is progressive, I, I always never really understood what that meant. And um, yeah, I, I, get, I get that. Uh, I, I, understand, uh, I understand what you're saying. Um, and I think um, a lot of, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love Russian, yes, and Gentle Giant and all the 70s stuff, uh, as much as the next guy and probably more. But um, a lot of them, newer progressive stuff I hear, it's a bit like four guys on the stage playing different songs. And I'm wondering where, where's the song? Mm. Where is the song in all the in all the, those scales and these old time signatures? Um, I mean, again, amazing musicianship, amazing. But I'm like, but where's the song? Where, where's the feeling? Where's the, the emotion? I mean, this also sounds weird when I say it out loud, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, black metal is usually very emotional. Mm -hmm. but, um, 3049. Of course, not emotional in uh, Baby, I'm going to put on some lovely songs for you here. Here's, uh, you know, 
at liberation, for instance, or whatever. It's it's not that kind of thing. But but liberation is um, five guys on the edge and slightly over the edge of their abilities, doing the best they can to put something crazy on tape. And tape being the operative word, since Frost never, you know, records digital, so it's tape. So yeah, those were those those are the tape days. So so, so the the feeling has to be there. The spirit has to be there. This um, it's also again very weird to talk about spirituality in the black man context, or maybe not. But but thirty forty nine has always been this greater than the sum of its parts. 3049 has a lot of, you know, chaos, magic, Kabbalah, there's there's a very occult shit going on there. But on stage, I, we all transform and we become 3049 and we become a force. We often talk about the, the band spirit. Because a lot of the times, we go in the studio and we don't exactly know what's going to happen, but we know that whatever's coming out at the other end is going to be extreme. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, are incapable of doing things, you know, the easy way, so it's always the hardest way possible. And, uh, yeah. But, um, but the results are, if I can be this blunt with, the results are undeniable. No one out there tells me that you know, 3049, you guys sound exactly like blah, blah, blah. No, it's you guys sound like 3049 and there's no two ways about it. Because there is this spirit, this kind of identity there that's undeniable. And I take pride in that, of course. But uh, my pride is kind of irrelevant here because this, this happens. We are kind of vehicles for this chaos to manifest, if you can be pompous about it. Yeah, and it, no, no, it, it makes sense entirely, and you're, you're, I'll say that's entirely right. Like black metal is is a, a very, very emotional genre. It, it's um, see, like all music is emotional, but I think um, black metal gets into that part of the mind, like exactly you said, like video games and like the fantasy world. Like it kind of takes you into a completely different place as opposed to like death or thrash metal, and. Um, I guess in some ways that can make things a bit more, in a way, introverted, mm. but in, in, in the kind of black metal way. And um, I, it's just, I think that's, that's the biggest difference between black and death metal is the way the, is where the music takes you. Because um, if we take like, uh, if we take like Altars of Madness, for example, you know, that's more kind of like a party, hang out with your friends, get drunk, mosh pit, have a good time kind of music but then if we take uh well, if, well let's take demon war for example now demon war is, is um demon war is my favorite black metal album and one of the reasons why it is is because that was the first black metal album i well i didn't buy it, it was actually a present from my mom because the story is, is that I went to uh, HMV when I was like, uh, how old was I? 14, 15, 14. I think I was 15 at the time. And I just got into 1349. Like I watched a sculpture of flesh music video, listened to a few songs of Hellfire. And I was like, hey, mom, this is a cool band. Look, it's only 10 quid. Can you buy it for me? She was like, all right, then. And I listened to Demon War and it didn't click with me for the first time. But I did know a few things. Like I was furious and it's a force. And there's some crazy guitar work going on in there. And then, um, and then over the year, I was listening to a few other bands as well. Then I got back to Demon War and I listened to it again. Then everything connected. Mm -hmm. And that album for me has, I think, for, for, well, the, oh, it, it sounds, it sounds kind of like silly in a way to, to say sometimes, but, but for me, anyway, that's the album that kind of encapsulates everything that's great about black metal because it has everything that past and modern black metal has uh that's what i think anyway because um just a few years after um demon or came out there was all of these bands doing like the dissonant thing 
Mm. And then if we go to uh, Pandemonium War Bells, for example, you had this uh, riff. I think that actually. <laughs> that's one of mine. I think that's my only riff for that one. <laughs> that is, see, that riff, yeah, that was, that's such a statement to start a song. Yeah, that was that was my only way for that poem. <laughs> oh, that is like I remember when you guys played that live, and something clicked in me then. Like it really, really did like click in me. I was like, this is like some of the most like freaky shit that I've ever heard, but I love it. <laughs> um, but yeah, like going back to like some of the writing on Demon Noir, because you've got all of these. Well, you've got Psalm seven 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 seven, which is like a proper fist bumpy party song. And you've got uh pandemonium war bells which is um fucking mm. ballistic it's it's like it's it's i, I don't know man i i don't know it, it kind of reminds me of okay here's here's a silly thing so i i don't know if you've watched um uh that anime evangelion do you know of it i know of it i have never watched it uh, right because it. it's because there's a scene at the end of the movie and spoilers if um anyone hasn't watched it yet but basically like everyone in the world turns into like like liquid and that is and and pandemonium war war, war bells has that kind of effect it's like the world is exploding and you're kind of like like melting and you don't know what's going on and then um but even like back to the emotional part as well because you've even got like um hellfire for example like that first riff like It's really kind of um, it's really kind of sad in a way, like it's kind of like um, it's so gloomy, but it's so like it's so grim at the same time. And um, but then you've got the ending, which is really really triumphant in that song as well. Um, yeah, well, Frost, yeah. Frost wrote the ending. Actually, yeah. Salve wrote the first riff and I wrote the middle riff and then that, that was it. There's only three riffs in that song. Mm. But it, it works so well because it's because every riff in there has an emotion behind it because that first riff is almost like someone sinking. Like mm. that first the first two chords is like um sinking, then it's rising, sinking, rising, rising, dun in and dun and sink again. And I think that's just really great songwriting because you're taking someone on that journey with with emotions in a way. And then you've got um, your riff, the da -na, da -na. so you've got like happy, sadder, sadder, and then he gets a little bit happier, like you're kind of like clinging on. Yeah, um, I, do the, I do the fifth bass line again, that I play the fifths of the root uh, chord, also yeah, the root yeah. also. <laughs> Because that's one thing I wanted to uh, to um, ask. Because in the because um, what I heard in the recording is when you're playing the over these chords, you're going. Um, yeah, I think you're just playing like the C to the B. Am I right? Or yeah, I do that for the actually for for a bet that whole album I recorded with three fingers. I can't do that shit anymore. And that's almost painful to do. For 13 minutes, 49 seconds, that kind of killed my fingers, but uh, but I still did it. So, was um, were all of the songs on Hellfire recorded in uh, one take, or at least tried to do it in one take? Because that's uh, I only cool. had one one day to do the bass. I usually only have one day, I had one day to do the bass uh, for all of those albums uh, up until. Uh... Mm, let me think. Uh, Infernal Pathway. I think I had more. No wait. Uh, Massive Cover of Chaos. Right. I had two days. No way. So all of all of the things uh, that back on the second day when the worst songs. <laughs> Massive order of chaos, that song. I had a, I woke up, my boss from my work was calling me and I was in the studio I'm in the studio, can't talk. And I had this 
crushing migraine and I've been saving Massive World of Chaos because it has a lot of these crazy parts. Yep. And I remembered I suffered through that whole fucking song, I think with 13 takes. And then Jared looks at me and he's like, yeah, we have a take, but you know, I don't believe it, delete. <laughs> and I was so fucking pissed that I played the whole song through in one take and there's this slide somewhere in there. Yeah. And I was I was so fucking pissed that that just happened before this. Oh, there we go. On storm style of playing because yeah, yeah, it is. it's this, you know, fast, <laughs> terrible fast picking shit. Um, all of that album, it was a pain. The more was also such a pain uh, when I was flesh. The chorus. Da, 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 that song was that that was made very late in the process. So I came to the studio and Archeon was not there. And then there was that riff. And I was like, what the actual fuck is going on there? <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah, no, that was such a pain, but um, I, made, I made it through and uh, we played it live afterwards. But yeah, I, and I love that song. It's, it's a great song to play, but it was such a pain in the studio to, oh, I could imagine. to figure out. And, and I mean, that's, that's the beauty and the curse of Archeon is that he writes like absolutely no one else and he plays like absolutely no one else. I remember, so Charleva and I, we covered the whole of, um, well, we did a playthrough of the whole of Liberation what? <laughs> on the channel. And um, I remember uh, you know, before we started like tracking the final songs, because, uh, you know, after our, um, our chat for Black Belt Legends, he was like, hey, I remember the I Breathe Spears riff. <laughs> I was like, cool, I've been struggling with that for ages. And then he goes... <laughs> And I was just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's and then, <laughs> when he does all like the hammer rods and stuff, and it's just like, this is the best thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, no, that was um, that was the song that the first book I like was really into whenever he heard us play was I Breed Spears. He even wrote the lyrics for that one. Wicked. Was, yeah, Wicked. No, and then there was also um, Evil Oath was another Archeon song as well. Like, yeah, that one. <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> You know, I haven't played those songs probably for a, for a month, but it's just that yeah. dancing around the fretboard and it's so, it's so distinct. Archeon is kind of his own, his own level in a way. Uh, with Cholva, I have been in many bands with Cholva uh, mm. because me, he and I, we, the same when when Rob was playing, we kind of got each other, so we kind of knew when it was time to do. We could we could jam, yeah, forever and ever and ever. And uh, Chalvin knows how to make these very open riffs. So like, okay, now now the bass can because between Frost and Archeon, there is playing bass in thirty forty nine is an exercise in restraint. Because, yeah, sure, I could uh, do, the, do the spastic stuff, I could try to origin it, but yeah, no, I don't think that would sound, it, it, it wouldn't be right. 
And uh, the mono R is uh, funny that you mentioned the mono R because at the time when either was presenting that to us or Gail presenting that to us, we were like, this is a death metal level. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, of course, we, uh, as time went by, we were like, oh yeah, no, it's, we're, we're going to make it a 349 album. And we were like, what the fuck is this death metal shit? Uh, times change. <laughs> times change quick. Yeah. No, I, th I think it's, uh, I love it, man. I love it. And because um, that was one of the questions that I was going to ask you is like the approach to uh, bass playing mm. in, um, in 1349, because how, because I was like, here's the, the question that I had um, written down was how does the speed of 1349 affect the bass playing? But I think you've just, um, You've kind of answered that in a way because yeah you could like follow exactly what Archaon's doing and try and as you say origin it go for that complete like tech death style of bass playing but i think as well having um having this level of like solidarity as well i think can can really help as yeah. well because then if you're because so, with all like the tech death style of playing if one person is like slightly out of time it can kind of uh, take away from the um it gets wobbly it, gets wobbly. it, does, it doesn't become uh, tight and impressive and i think also um i mean on liberation i was i was young i was 23 when we recorded that so i was see how fast i can play and i played everything the guitars did and more and it was ridiculous but that's how it was and uh, i kind of gradually realized that sometimes it's heavier and it has a better feeling if you just you know pump those root notes and you do small movements there as i kind of started to understand uh, more about harmony um because Shalv uh, in the reward in in general he, he's extremely good with harmonies and with this melodic um, stuff always in Pantheon Eye in all the bands and when he has always had this amazing harmony stuff pop popping up um, and uh, with him kind of gone from 3049 then I realized that someone has to hold back a bit and kind of make sure that there's still this heaviness and this um, to a degree feeling there because we could very quickly end up as some sort of black metal version of origin if if we don't kind of rein it in at some point um and i mean origin is fantastic i wish i would be that good but and they are amazing dudes we toured with them in the us and it was picking my jaw up from the floor every night watching those guys do whatever the fuck they do uh and I was like, we, I wish I had that much time. Um, you know, I wish I was that good, but um, that, that, that wasn't for me. Um, so with 1341, I'm also going to show you a, a scale you probably know, but um, yeah, but it's, uh, it's the most important scale for understanding 3041 bass playing. Yep, that that guy. Yeah, that that sums up ninety percent of what I'm doing when I'm not doing. And it's actually that's in Atomic Chapel somewhere. Yes. <laughs> da na na na. Chapel, there's also some insane riffs there. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, it's yeah. Yeah, all of that. That shit is. That's one of those. That's you know what? That's actually one thing I was going to ask about Svart Lotus. Actually, is like why why is it that you use the harmonic minor scale so much in your riffs? It's um, especially in like that first um, 
Svart Lotus album because there's so much like harmonic minor movements. Uh, yeah. there. Like especially was it the first song on the um on the first album? That's the one. That's it, yeah. Yeah, that's the stem from the deep voices from the I mean, with Fart Lotus, I used for some reason eight string guitars. Mm -hmm. I used Kemper amps for uh, since 2015 because I'm lazy and I don't want to buy and shit, so I used the Kemper until I got a Quad Cortex. Mm -hmm. And after that, I never looked back. That shit's the bomb. Nice. Yeah, but I don't. I can't really say why I love the melodic harmonic minor so much, but it's it's there in my brain somewhere. There's always a lot of the riffs happen around this. I think it's part of this uh, my folk music training that this uh, um, I don't know if it's correct anymore. To the, they call them Arab minors when I was. Um, mm. Minor scales, I'm not sure if that's... Yeah, Phrygian, Phrygian dominant, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's, that's the one, yeah. And, and I, I love the half-step things, kind of, they, they go well with something inside me. Hmm. And the trills, this... Yeah. That's a very Norwegian folk music thing, has a lot of these trills. Uh, on the, the last Swart Lotus album, there's this. Yeah. Uh, lurking Fear. Um, uh, I have worked at a music school for some time, and there was this. Um, my colleague played this uh, fiddle, traditional Norwegian Hardanger fiddle. It has a lot of uh, extra strings that can just resonate, and it's, it was called a troll instrument back in the days. And the Christians banned it, of course, like they do everything that's fun. And he was playing this kind of very traditional schlott, which is a dancing song. And, uh, that's that's kind of cool. And then uh, and I came home like, what would that be if it was metal? And I, Maybe something like that. <laughs> and so on and so forth. You yeah. know, um, I, I, because Swat Lotus again is me doing something else than being fast and aggressive and evil, of course, that happens too. Uh, because ultimately, Swat Lotus is about me playing whatever fuck I want to play. Uh, but uh, I have 349 for all my fast, aggressive, uh, crazy needs. So it's I I don't want to do the same thing many places. <clears throat> so there's this um, sadness in a way in in Bursum, for instance, and a lot of the early black metal that is melodic. Uh, folk in, influenced definitely, and and uh, and has this sadness, and then of course the minor scale comes, um, and also I mean for dramatic effect, the the switching from uh, minor to ma major to minor, and mm. like uh, first EP, there's this. Mm. Uh, I mean fifth. Then Major, hello, it's Major coming to meet you. So it's a bit, um, it's about, I guess you don't really see too much of the fretboard or anything, but let me know and I'll, of course. Mm -hmm. No, no, because that reminds me of um, something from uh, uh, Carving on the, um, I, I think it's Carving, but the third song on, on the album that you're playing before, it's the... Um... No. Like you play this. Um... Oh yeah. That... Was I played the? Oh, you played. Cool. 
and then after the fourth time I switch to fifth so a bit of the minor again no yeah something like that going back to uh, what we were talking about with like bass um mm. how how does the speed of 1349 affect bass in the mix when you're mixing well the thing is uh, if you if you try to play super fast particularly on the low b which i'm uh, sometimes uh, stupid enough to do then you get the <laughs> so um uh, that's also part of the reason why i started the I have the dark glass, but I also have a um, clean DI before it, so I send the clean signal out and then I distort everything through the, so you can blend a bit. But I also at some point realized that maybe I should, um, even though I like playing fast, I can half time it or play eights when they are playing sixteenths, so it's still fast, but it's still heavy. Hmm. If everyone goes sixteenths, <laughs> you get the. Um, I mean, uh, like everyone who has a computer and has access to drum programming, at some point you try to program drums as fast as you can fucking do. I tried 666 BPM, and after a while I was like, okay, but now it's just notes. It's just, that was the bass drums. So, uh, and the same principle applies to the bass. So, I tried to kind of, for effects, I can kind of really speed it up at, in parts, but most of the time I try to kind of keep it so it's heavy and not uh, not just kind of random rumbling. It has to be heavy and has to move air. And of course, uh, live with 1349, particularly since we only have one guitarist, I occasionally switch to cording uh, and, and do a bit more this. Um, second guitar style um, which is weird because um, to be bluntly honest apart from the acoustic fiddling at home I I never was um, practicing guitar much until 2012 when I came back here and I started thinking about doing smart lotus before that I, I was a bass player and I still am a bass player um, but kind of really getting myself a good guitar and seeing okay now I'm gonna figure out this, this thing, you yeah, know that, that that was never in in my mind really. Uh, I played guitar in some band with the uh, child back in two thousand and one maybe. I have never broken so many strings in one song as I did that that show. So. I think I broke three strings on the guitar first songs. So I was like, yeah, no, this is hopeless. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I get, I get you. I get you because, you know, like I have played bass live in the past, and there's a sort of level of relaxation to it. And I don't know, I don't know how to articulate it properly because it's not not a thing that I've done very much. But there's a there's a chance where you can just kind of just relax a bit more. Um, because in some ways, there's less to go wrong. But if you do something wrong, it's kind of a bit more noticeable in a way. And um, the cool thing about the bass guitar is that you can just literally just hammer the crap out of it, and it's still um, it's still fine. And um, that's that's a really cool thing that you mentioned um, switching from eighths to sixteenth notes um, as well in your writing. Because um, in the um, in the black metal bass lessons and the way I, I play and record bass now, it's like I've never playing the bass uh, with like full 16th notes all the time. It's um, it's eighth yeah. notes. And the reason it's just for that extra level of clarity. Because mm. uh, it's exactly like you said, you don't want that like flubbiness and it, it takes away too much. Because mm. uh, more is more, but less is more as well. And it's uh, it's hard to articulate, but it's one of those things that everything needs to be more in a certain aspect or or less in a certain aspect as well and um I, well here, here's one way of, of um, kind of thinking about it it's like if we take um for example i don't know smoke on the water for mm. example 
you know, da 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 da, da you know, only a few chords, but mm. instantly it's got everyone kind of like grooving to it and able to remember it because it's just that it's a lot easier for people to um, not only access, but it's like easier for something to be mm. like catchy if something is less. And um, or even let's take um, yeah, the bass doesn't play that riff as I guess you're aware of. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. But <laughs> but it's the yeah, you know, it's the principle of like less is more sometimes. It's like the um all right here's a here's a bass moment. It's that bit in Freezing Moon, you know, bam 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 bam. One of the most iconic moments in the song, and it's just two notes. Hmm. But then sometimes like less is more, and sometimes using less in a more situation, i.e. hyper blast moment, archaeon, and then if you go, then it's kind of works. Like, um, ah, yes, I remember. So chasing dragons. Um, oh, yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, and, uh... and then you go along and they just go, e! <laughs> yeah, the whole... I have to actually remember how to play that slow. That was an odd moment. I don't <laughs> how. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah, that's how it goes because uh, originally it was. So, but uh, Frost dropped the first two notes, so we had to get in and I had to relearn it, so that's... Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to... yeah, yeah. That is, that's got a cool riff that song. Yeah, of course it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that song is actually the reason why I got a feeling in five string. Yeah. Because so much of that song happens. Oh, let's go down to C. Let's go down to B. And I was like, let's go up to C. Let's go up to E. No, let's go down. I see, yeah, gotcha. But I really like, um, I really like the fact that there is five string uh, in 1349 bass, and it just gives you that extra breathing room as well, and you can use the lower notes a bit more as well, and you can kind of, kind of keep everything in in position, in a yeah. way. Because I remember watching the one of the teasers for Massive Cauldron of Chaos. It's uh, the riff for Chain. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good riff actually. Yeah. That's a great riff. And then when it breaks down, it's all boom. That's we uh, play uh, I think uh I was eel again. Oh god, yes, I was um um yeah. Because it's cooler if you do the stabs on the. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have to really, can really dig in, <laughs> but it's a bit of a jump. Yeah, me and my friend we covered Ewaseon on the channel, man, and it's just just as a. It's just so much groove in that song. 
There's okay. also a bit of octave displacement on the bass line. That's so cool. <laughs> Uh, usually I, I have these tricks to remember how many times something goes is you play RTM does this a lot that he plays every second time different hmm. or if you're really lucky he plays every time different so you have no idea of knowing which <laughs> time but um but every so then usually I put in an octave displacement or something a harmony somewhere on the second round so I know that okay now now it's the second round and I just repeat this now two more times and I'm safe Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, man, cheating. <laughs> no, that's great, man. Like, um, that, that's such a cool idea. I never, I've never thought of um, it like that because I've always kind of followed um, that kind of A B ending kind of thing where you you've got one part of the riff and you got B ending and you come back to it and then you sometimes got like a fourth time ending. So A B A C style of uh, songwriting um, as well. But yeah, like back back to A O S A on man. Like some of the. Yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah, we were kids. We were crazy kids. <laughs> oh, dude, it's, it's it's the best. It's the best. Like, um, thirteen forty nine always has a special place in my heart, and nothing else kind of, kind of hits hits the same way. And um, yeah, man, there's so much cool stuff in there. And um, what? Oh, yeah. So one thing I wanted to ask you is like with them. With playing bass and writing, how did it differ in 1349 and Pantheon I? Because I remember you saying like Shalva gives you uh, like a little bit more space to play with the bass. And um, yeah, I just wanted to just hear it in your own words, like the difference in like writing style for um, for each band. Oh, Pantheon I, we were also again uh, in the early days, we were, I mean, uh... There was this precursor band to Pantheon I, um, uh, and I try to remember the name. Uh, was it Into Oblivion or Internal Oblivion? Which was um, Chalva, of course, and he doing bass. Uh, Sagsta was, no, he was gonna do the guitars, but I don't think he played on the demo. And it was Renton from, well, early Pantheon I and Trollfest and everything. That kid's a fucking genius, Renton, he is uh, amazing. He has, his brain is uh, next level shit. Uh, but yeah, and, and a vocalist uh, whose name eludes me again, he, he was not a metal guy, he was, he had, you know, he did clean vocals and Chalva did the green vocals on that demo. Um, and that was recorded one evening in 1999, I think. I can't, can't remember much, but I remember we did that demo and there there it went. And then nothing happened, and then Andre and Sarista and Renton did uh, start a band, you know, with the first demo and everything. They came to my house and they borrowed the, the thumb bass to record the bass. And then after a while, I they asked me to audition or something funny. And I came, I showed up unprepared and I did a terrible job, so they didn't ask me back. And I was like, yeah, well, whatever. I was probably drunk at the time, I don't remember. And then they had suddenly got a show. And uh, Andre called me, Chalvin called me again. And he was like, well, maybe if you, um, maybe you, Bring your A game this time around and not, you know, stupid shit, then, then this could work. And I did. And uh, a couple of albums later, yeah. No, but but, but with, with Pantheon, I, it was a lot, anything goes sort of. Um, there was a lot of aggression, and but there, there was this symphonic element, particularly with the string sections, and I did upright bass on some parts, um, because I could, and because I had an upright with the bow and everything, <laughs> there's upright on the modular also, actually. On the modular, the actual song, there's, I have double stuff with the upright bass. Uh, I don't know if you really hear it in the mix, but it's there. Um, but but Pantheon, there was, 
It was busy. There, there's a lot of need or I'm trying to steal the show. That's in retrospect maybe not the best stuff out there, but there's there's um, there was so much kind of melodic room in a way between the cello and the guitars that I got a bit this okay let's let's see I I kind of disconnected a bit from the guitars and went in with the cello and the violin to, to do this classical kind of melodic stuff and 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 have a bass that was deriving stuff a lot more. Uh, and of course, Panty Vi also was very democratic that everyone could come with riffs and I have made some of the weirdest riffs there and some of the most kind of normal riffs there. It's, um, it, it was, um, we also spent a lot of time in the rehearsal room and just doing Panty and I, it was great fun. I sometimes wonder if it was too um, closed in a way that it, that it was a lot of fun for us doing it, but maybe not so much fun for people on the outside. Um, that's not really for me to judge. The, the albums are out there, but but um, you know, uh, it, it was a fun experience as a bass player because I I had full creative freedom to do whatever the fuck I want to do and at times maybe I shouldn't have but I still did and there's lots of weird parts that I have no idea what, what I'm doing and why I did it but um, it felt right at the time um, yeah but that was, that was fun that was also um, where I started doing vocals again because, of course, back here where I grew up when I was a kid, I had friends who could sing. But I was the only kid who could sound like Cavalera, Max Cavalera, or, you know, make ugly sounds. So, so they put a microphone in my face and say, do that. <laughs> that thing and you be the monster and that's cool. Um, and then... Um, and that kind of, as soon as I met Raven, then, then I didn't do vocals because he did the vocals. I mean, he did them much better than me, so why the fuck would I do vocals? So I just focused on other stuff. But um, through Panty and I, I kind of found my own voice again. And then after a while, I just started doing backing vocals in 3049 as well. And yeah. After some time, I realized, hey, maybe I should do, you know, vocals, vocals, and then, then I had fuck vocals. So then, but I, I mean, but it's so different to do uh, vocals when you're playing bass and when you're playing guitar. I mean, guitarists have the easiest fucking time of it. You can just strum shit and make you know sing. While but as a bass player, you have to think about the timing and the rhythm and the complexities. Oh, that's so interesting because um, I found I found I find it slightly easier to do bass and vocals than guitar and vocals because I tried to um, <laughs> here's the thing so I tried to um, do the vocals for I'm Abomination and play guitar at the same time. Yeah, that was not easy, <laughs> and that was me just like practicing at home trying to trying to do it, and it's just like you know, the da -da 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 and trying to get all the vocal lines and stuff with all the chord yeah. changes and stuff. -na 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 -na. It's like I need to disconnect the, my throat from like, yeah. my entire nervous system. Yeah. Trying to do it. Very separate worlds. Um... Yeah, and I, but it, yeah, with like the strumming stuff, it's a lot easier, I will admit. Um, you know, the simpler the guitar is and the simpler the rhythm is, then it's a, a lot easier to like focus on the voice. Panty and I fell apart, sadly, um, at some point. Uh, in the, I mean, I moved away from Oslo in 2012, but by then the band was gone. Hmm. Uh, and I can't really say what it was, but I mean, um, I mean, everyone in 
Phantom, I had shit loads of other bands. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I had so many bands at that time because I was terrible at saying no. I just said yes and wanted to be in the rear room as much as humanly possible. So I think I had five or six bands going. And I don't like projects. Uh, for some reason, I, I need to be in bands. And this, uh, I, I have done kind of guest stuff and session stuff and all. I have done, but this idea of cram four guys together, I think it's the, the spirit part of it that doesn't mm. resonate with me in a way because. Um, no, I don't, I, I don't feel this kind of um, the energy of people in the same room and then then I, I don't really get inspired in the same way. It gets a bit lackluster. And um, so I, I really like this. When I was in Tyrann with the, the drummer and guitarist of Tudor back when they had a break, mm -hmm. we were in the rehearsal room also constantly. But uh, me and the Tudor guitarist, we are both, um, we are not good with promotion, we are not good with, you know, the business side of anything. We just want to play ugly music and be left alone, so we did an album and then that was it, because, you know, none of us had any kind of, you know, we did it, it's fucking great, what now? I don't know, what now? Nah. <laughs> yeah, it was just that album, but that was a great album. It was great fun, and but that that was all there is to that. And um, I think a lot of things have a kind of natural lifespan in a way. And uh, this is hard for me to say, considering the fact that uh, if you asked uh, the me that recorded Liberation at you know, in 23 more years from now, you're going to still be doing this. I'll be like, yeah, fuck you, I'll be dead. Fuck off. Not <laughs> gonna happen. I was going to be an old dude uh, with gray hair or no hair playing black metal. Fuck that. But um, here we are. And, uh, <laughs> you yeah, know, it's... Um, I... Uh, I regret nothing, right? It's um, I, 3049 has consistently got better over the years, although we have, of course, changed. I mean, um, at some point we just had to change. Um, at some point we had to, Revelations of the Black Flame, where, you know, you, you take 3049 and you take away everything people expect which is the speed and the blast beats and, and then you see what's left and you give that to people and people hate you well but that's um, that's their problem um, and i mean that studio session was uh, i wrote uh, what's that song da, 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 da. Serpentine. yeah serpentine sibilance yeah and yeah, that, that was i wrote a couple of riffs for that one really really cool <laughs> Ravn wrote that riff. Which one? Uh, Ravn wrote that. Da, 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 oh, cool. Da, 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 that, that was him. I wrote the, the first and the last riff of that song, actually. Cool. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one morning again, but I, I love that shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Didn't you uh, write bits of Invocation? Not the thing with the Invocation, that's the first song, right? Um, there, there's, um, there's this, uh, there's a bass solo. Because yes. I, I fucked up. I'm human, I fuck up. And, uh, and I played the wrong note, I played, and then I, I, I don't know, whatever the fuck, I'm just gonna go for it. And uh, Tom uh, G. Horry was in the studio for that, and the monarch. And I'm just, you know, doing this weird shit, and he looks at me like, keep going, keep, keep going, like, okay. Tom G. Horry says I must keep going, so then... That's that's a jam. I, I played one, I made a mistake. Of course it was it was a mistake within the realms of harmony. Mm. So I could have just, you know, kept a straight face and kept going, but I was like, now fuck it, let's let's solo. That's there's never gonna be a bass solo and there will not again, so let's do it. Because that's that's um that's one of yeah, I, I love the ending of the song because it's just it kind of just melts into its own kind of thing and um i kind of wish that there was a bit more of that in 1349 actually where it's just like that that moment where the music just becomes well, i mean the music always is what it is but then you it's just got this little bit more of a bass focus to it and you're kind of just like doing your thing it's just like yeah you got all these like melodies and it's just really it just it's just cool as fuck and um another thing with the uh, invocation is what was, who decided to have the screaming at the beginning? Because I think that's one of the best ways to start an album. That guy is um, it's not it's no one in the band. It's yeah. a Norwegian singer songwriter who was recording in the same studio, and um, I can't remember why, but for some reason, like screaming into this microphone, <laughs> he went for it, and he really went for it. We're like. This is fucking crazy. Like he went for it in so many ways. So we just kept the tape rolling and he kept on screaming. And afterwards it was like that was pretty cathartic. You know, yeah, I'm I'm sure it was. That was that was something else. And it's a perfect kind of beginning for an album that it sets the tone that you're gonna go down. We're we're heading down into the monoir, just teasing you with what's going to happen. Hmm. Yeah, and um, another part of Invocation, which is awesome, is just the way it kicks off, you know, you go... Ksh, ksh. <laughs> like, uh, such a... It, it's like how you're saying uh, about, the, um, about the bass player, like, all he's doing is just playing a note, but he's just using rhythm to make something so alive and it's just just groovy as shit and then that archaeal thing <laughs> yeah it's just that's a cool one and then um Serpentine was really cool, and then you've got um, Maggot Fetus, which is yeah. just that's a great live song. Yeah, no, that, that's that's fun to play live. Well, it's, it's a bit tiresome for you. Yeah, yeah, and then you got the yeah, and then you got the that <laughs> yeah, that, that bit is like, ah, I wish we could do something else than this movement now, but um, but but it was um. But yeah, I mean, it, it was a um, risky move, I guess, career-wise and all the things to do, to do that album and to follow up Hellfire with that. I mean, I imagine the world might have looked a bit different if we followed up Hellfire with Demonoir. Hmm. It would most likely have been this kind of rocket escalating, but uh, at the time that was what we had to do. That was what uh, was needed for us to do. Mm. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it's it's a kind of in many ways <laughs> a halfway point in the 3049 history if you it is a very sharp divide between the the old 3049 and kind of the Hmm. New 349, although 349 is 349, but I mean, um, Liberation, Beyond the Apocalypse, and Hellfire, they were kind of like three in a row, they were <laughs> pretty quick after. I mean, in all honesty, Liberation was recorded in 2001. Hmm. It took a couple of years to get it out, but, but the others came like this and then we yeah. just uh, kind of, okay here's the first three albums the difficult ones out of the way let's um let's see where we go now and um i mean the monolar was <laughs> it was his own thing it, it um i think it was where we kind of took the occult shit to uh, to another level and, and we did, um, I mean, darkness is, it's many things, but, but in this uh, spiritual and emotional sense, the monoir is very loaded with this heavy darkness. Um, the the monoir song itself is very kind of, slow but it's so heavy and it's so threatening and i i did a lot of octave displacement down on the low b string to really push yeah. and you get this kind of lumbering beast sort of um, effect uh, yeah, because uh, all of our games riffs were kind of very high pitch and i was like no let's okay there's a b there let's go all the way down and really keep it really dark and this threatening in a way um, because ultimately I think for me bass playing if we have to if we want to talk about bass playing more than just notes it's about um, a feeling and an effect and a kind of what do you want this to do for the song um, and I mean, there, there are many approaches, but sometimes there is this <sighs> lyrical aspect to it where you can, where you can do kind of tension. And I wish I had some good musical theory here to back up what I'm trying to say, but, but it is this, um, um, I, in Mortem, I play with uh, Svarad, you know, the Arturus keyboard, and he plays guitar. Um, and he, of course, is heavily into classical music and can talk about composing in a language that makes sense. But he, he says uh, this about tension and the kind of call and response and how you kind of resolve. Mm. And um, how the bass kind of does a lot for the harmony. You no know, matter what the guitars do, kind of the bass is what makes your brain kind of understand the harmony there and the responsibility on the shoulders of the bass player kind of to, to deliver the correct harmonic content for what the song is uh, about. Hmm. And sometimes that's, you yeah. know, because let's be honest, being in a band is also a bit of a pissing contest. Because particularly when you're young, you want to show off how great you are and you want to be faster and better than everyone else. But uh, that's a young man's game. And at some point you have to be clever about it. If that makes any sense. No, 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 it, it makes perfect sense entirely because um, like we're talking about like harmonic displacement as well, where everything kind of like sits sometimes because it's um it's that kind of opposites attract mm. kind of thing with um with uh with playing as well because i remember when well with my first band when our bass player he got a five string bass and he was using it more it was just like yes this is amazing because we can do our things in this part and then he can add all oh, this low end as well so um we had this we've got this riff 
um, that we used to play. And you know, when he's doing it on the bass, like ba-bam, ba-boom, ba-bam, 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 ba-bam. almost like in a uh, fieldy corn style of way of like the kind of like percussive, like low B bass stuff going on. It just sounded so much heavier. Mm-hmm. And then like qu- uh, chord progressions from like an E minor to a B, for example, you know, he's playing the E and then it just like this super low weighted B and it just works. And um, going back to uh, Demon Noir, like you said, cause you're in the verse riff, you've got bah, on your bass, like, dun, 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 bom boom when you go down to the lower notes and it's just of course when i did the, i do this <laughs> because when i had done this i had the worst hmm. take it down okay i did a little melodic so shoot me but then um, let's bring the beast back so you don't it's uh, this call response function <laughs> As well as a bit of, uh, oh, you think it's only nice, but it's not. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that's, what's, that's what's so sick about um, the way you write and like just, and just using bass not only is just like a, not like as an addition, but making it more distinct in its own thing, because it just makes everything so much better. It's like um, more, more justice for, for bass and black metal and Use it probably in a way, but it's like going going back to what you're saying about revelations of the Black Flame. Like I, it I think it's one of those albums where if people are expecting the super hyper blast 1349, then you're you're no way gonna get it. But if you're expecting that other side of 1349, where it's like that foreboding darkness, where it's kind of like mysterious and and dismal, then it's um, then it's brilliant. Like you've got the um, You've got that song, I think it's Misanthropy, before Uncreation comes in uh, with the piano. And then it kind of gets like the, the weird string sound at the end. And it's the, um, the this. And it's kind of like reverse. And then it comes in with the, uh, the distorted guitars. And I just think, I think it's it's done so well, and um, I th- yeah, like Revelations of the Black Flame is I think one of the more misunderstood releases. It's not a traditional traditional black metal album with the kind of like tremolo pick guitars and stuff, but what it does focus on is like that the other side of black metal where everything's kind of just evil. It's an atmospheric album in that sense. I mean, it it reflects heavily upon our love of Twin Peaks. Like the TV series Twin Peaks. I mean, you yeah, know, um, that's um, this Twin Peaks is very good in this uh, how the mundane because you dwell on the mundane for very, very long. So long that it starts to get uncomfortable, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, and of course, I, I love Twin Peaks. We, we all do in the 49. It's one of those things we have in common that we. If I'm ever kind of stuck writing a song or whatever, I watch watch some Twin Peaks, watch some stuff from the Black Lodge where they're all talking backwards and shit's crazy. And I'm like, okay, guitar time. Oh, uh, right. Because I've, I've never watched Twin Peaks, that's why. But um, I think now's the time. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> now's the time. But, um, You've done all the stuff. No, no worries. Plenty of time later. That, that leads me on to a question that I had. So, with after revelations of the black flame you in you guys included the tunnels mm. on your albums what was the decision to add those in no i mean we explored a lot of that um, ambient side of things um and also live it's uh we've discovered or we've decided that it's much better if it's never totally silent so then you have these kind of ambient tracks between the songs leading you into so so it it makes a much more whole experience not just this it's a bunch of dudes on stage playing some songs and in between the songs it's like hey guys how you doing you having a good time there's none of that 1349 is totally quiet noise bang 
and one hour later you're like what the hell just happened there for one hour now yeah and uh, and that's um, that's of course the intention and uh, so so a lot of those tunnels are kind of intros to the song that can be used live as well um also to give ourselves a little bit of breathing room on stage um which is important um when you do very aggressive shit you need to um you need yes. to because um... before before you guys used the tunnels well it was you like playing bass yeah i was playing do me weird yeah. shit. and um I and one thing that... more music actually because I remember, like, on the uh, Demon Wire tour you did in 2011 in the UK, uh, one distinct thing that I remember was whenever you played the bass, the floor rumbled, and I'd never, ever experienced that. And I was just like, dude, this is just, this is just sick. This is just fucking cool. I need, I need this kind of, like, energy in, in my life <laughs> kind of thing. Like, this kind of, like, thundering sound. And... Um, what were you using on that tour? Because it was 2011. So was that the um, was that the Sans amp? That was the Sans amp. That was this um, split pedal board with the the radial DI for the clean and the Sans amp for the for the distortion and then blending it. Because um, if you have the clean, then you can route that to the subs and really feed the subs. So you get this thunderous tractor, as we call it, uh, sound. That's the magic. That's because uh, I I did a lot in Panty Life for some reason. I always did the low B. Hmm. If I could do the low B instead of playing the seventh fret on the E, then I would drop down this to get this drop effect where your stomach would feel it, feel it. And uh, and that that needs a, a certain bass sound, and it needs the bass to be kind of powerful and really felt. Um, many people say, or some people say, who cares what they, who are they, which one, and so on and so forth, but uh, that uh, in 349 it's hard to hear the bass. And I usually say, well, you feel the bass, and you will definitely feel the bass if it's gone. <laughs> and uh, of course there's a classic, why does, why does 349 need the bass player? And I usually say, take him away and you'll find out. But um, but yeah, it's um. <laughs> Speaking of bass players and black metal, though, um, I I mentioned you from the and uh, Ulver all that shit before, and it has to be said, without that guy, my play. I mean, I I got the Rebuilds album in '96, I think, and that changed my whole kind of idea of what the bass could do in black metal. Uh, and I was like, okay, why the fuck have I been doing this when I can when I can do all this? Because he has this um, melodic kind of very lyrical way of playing, mm -hmm. and um, absolutely one of one of the greats in in black metal or in any genre. To be honest, he's absolutely one of the greats. And it comes to bass playing, uh, black metal has. In general, a bunch of good bass players, but he's kind of unique, mm. and that's uh, that's good and good in a different level. Oh yeah, for sure. No, I, I I agree with that entirely, especially on like the um the uh, early Ulva stuff as well. It's just like yeah, yeah. It's just, just... Yeah, well, he did all this uh, melody stuff kind of on top of, um, and then you really feel it when he goes down and does the um, low stuff. Then you. You get that shift in the music, and uh, I I learned a lot from him. Uh, it was a bit annoying though. I, I mean, he's a good friend of mine and all that. But when I first met him, I was like, man, I spent so many years learning those debutants and the bass lines. And he looks at me, oh, that stuff. I just improvised that in the studio. I had no idea what I was playing. <laughs> uh, you fucking bastard. You bastard. That, that's not even funny. But he was like, no, no, he just did stuff, and it's amazing. Oh, that's cool as fuck, man. Because like that spawn, there's something magical in 
spontaneity and like being spontaneous mm -hmm. as well and then some things things that are unplanned just sometimes end up working so much better absolutely and i mean uh, both i mean the, the the good thing about debut and Selma, it's it's easily my favorite black metal band it's easily one of my favorite bands but it is everyone involved in that band is brilliant like next level fucking brilliant uh, i mean when i started playing guitar some years ago one of my goals i have to figure out how to play traces of reality by the event sky because that riff is genius oh yeah yeah the genius of that riff is fucking genius i still haven't figured it out like 100 percent and uh, but that's so amazing and i mean oh, yeah. black medium current that album easily the best album of 2023 Easily the best album for a decade. That was so good. That was this weird homecoming to the nineties. Every everyone, all of my, all, everyone I had talked about that, like yeah, that was like, it just took us back, back to the nineties. And no, uh, <laughs> so I mean, yeah, fantastic. And I mean, of course, uh, good old Kalle. The Red Runs and he plays, you know, well, he plays everything, he's one of those guys. Such an amazing musician, good vocalist, good drummer, good guitarist, good bass player. All these kind of amazing guys, they just get together at some point in time and they do this amazing thing and then go. Who knows if, I mean, they have been talking about doing another album, but who knows? I don't think that's going to happen, to be honest. I think um, I think it's going to be that one album, and that's going to be perfect. Mm. Yes. I think it's. I think sometimes that's okay as well, because if you try to, because if you've got something that's so iconic, it's very hard to follow up with something else. And then mm. if you do try to do something, it kind of it's it's the remake thing. I don't I don't know if you've seen this lately in in, um, in like video games especially. Like you've got like Resident Evil Two had its remake. Resident Evil Three had its. It wasn't really a remake. It was a reimagining. And you got like the Final Fantasy Seven stuff as well. And you've had uh, like Doom come back. The Doom one was really good. Um, Doom. Um... I didn't try, I mean, I'm too old now for things that require a lot of coordination and quick reactions. That's, I'm too old. For okay, that. okay. And I, but the, I, um, I played the original game, of course, back in the <laughs> Yeah, great, great game. I still prefer it. I still prefer it, man. I used to play like a shit ton of Doom 2. And the reason why I like Doom 2 a lot more than Doom 1 is because you can use the double barrel shotgun. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed the Doom 3 as well, the, the, um, the kind of reimagined a bit more horror, I, I like that, it had this Lovecraftian vibe that, hmm. or a man full of Cthulhu tattoos that made a lot of sense, of course. Not sure, because I was, I was way too young when I played, I mean, I was, I was like 10 or 12 and I just couldn't figure the game out at the time, whereas with like the other Dooms, they were just that little bit more approachable, but even, um, even Quake like quake was that like the first quake like that that used to scare the shit out of me as a kid but now I've like that's you know as a game that's better than doom dare i say just because it's it's so creepy mm. in a way um but yeah like the, so, but going back to the remake thing it's like you have the original and the original is its own thing and if you try and recreate the original or or if there's something that's so iconic you try to follow up it just kind of makes makes things a little bit um different or weird or if you try to or if you have the thing and then someone tries to change a little part of it or the story then it just doesn't have that same impact that the original thing had um i think media media it, video games cds music all that stuff are all a result of time they're all a, they're all like a, a thing of its era yeah and some things can only be sometimes some things can only be understood in their era and 
but even now people can still understand how important some things are. I think for me, uh, for instance, Venom is a band that a lot of people love in my genre. Hmm. But I didn't hear Venom until I was, you know, 16. And then I was like, but these are, you know, very crappy musicians playing joke songs about Satan. Hmm. This doesn't give me anything kind of... And of course, later when I look at it in context, in uh, the year is 1982, and the hardest thing you've heard is Motorhead, yeah, then Venom is the, the logical next step. Yeah. And then it makes sense, but that train kind of went for me in the same way with Kiss. Yeah. Everybody loves Kiss, but... Yeah, it's an okay disco band, and then it's a cash cow kind of thing. And yeah, they have the paint and all that stuff, but I you know it, it never hits me. And I guess it feels dated, but but, but they, they have also created, they have created something that will last now with hologram technology, whatever. They will last forever. And... Um, and can kind of survive out of context to a certain degree. 1349 will not. <laughs> you have to see us and where we come from and what time we show up and all that stuff. Because if you, 100 years from now, pick up Liberation and put it in your CD player or whatever player you have, most likely, what's wrong with this thing? Why is it so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I yeah, I get that as well because um, that you know I I I never got into Venom myself. Um, I never got into Kiss either, but I do you know what I there's I'll say from like the eighties the bands that I really got into was well only Mayhem and Iron Maiden really like the ones that I really really got into because I used to listen to a shit ton of Iron Maiden like Iron Maiden learning Iron Maiden songs like Hallowed Be Thy Name really escalated my guitar playing as well and um you know I you know I had um, a couple Slayer albums and uh, but it just didn't connect with me the same way that Iron Maiden did or Mayhem did so um no, it's really it's really curious uh, how these th how these things kind of happen. But of course, it's all down to like everyone's got their own style and everyone's got their own tastes and things as well. So I don't, I never, I never blame anyone for not liking something um, oh, or anything. And that, that's pointless. Basically, people people like what they like, and you there's no point in trying to convince anybody that's that's Christianity, and we have no need for that. Um, I mean, we all come from, everything does different things. I mean, the beauty of music is that it speaks to the heart without going through the brain first. Mm. So, um, so I can't explain or help the fact that distorted guitars, double bass drums and screaming vocals do something to my heart that is joyful and good. One to other people is like, what the fuck is that noise? Right, but they can't help it, I can't help it. Um, I'm a product of many things. Um, I, I mean, I, you mentioned computer games. Um, so I'm going to bring out my acoustic. Oh yeah, go ahead. The single most um, important thing for all my songwriting in Swart Lotus, if I can do it. Yeah. Opening notes to Twistrum in Diablo. <laughs> those yeah. that twelve string, those not like that's it. Yeah. That, that sums it up. It's just something the way the I don't know, man. There's something the way that the guitar sounds and just having that kind of evilness where something's kind of like grim but then it gets grimmer it's just it's just the best the half step, the kind of dissonance for exactly that. yeah half step yeah right on it's like okay yeah no, that's all you need you you don't need first you don't you just need the right notes and the right mood oh, of course yeah yeah that's right because i i find that different keys have different kind of 
feelings as well. Like if I'm playing, you know, riffs in F sharp minor, for example, it sounds a little bit, it feels a lot more triumphant than opposed to playing in E. But then if you play something in E, sometimes moving it to C mm. makes it a lot more grimmer as well. And I think, um, I think different tunings really help um, give off certain moods mm. as well, because um, I find E standard to be quite cold. But then, like m the more kind of like emotional style of riffs, I find um, work really nicely in D standard as well. And what was the um, what was that um, your spinal spinal tap? It was like D minor, the saddest key, makes everyone cry. Something like that. And it, I don't know, man. Like D minor just does that. Um, just makes things a little bit more sad, but it's also really brutal at the same time. So it's quite versatile. But um, but yeah, like the sound of certain notes um it's an interesting one because i had a conversation with a friend of mine and this is going back to like feeling and atmospheres like in black metal and he was saying like black metal needs to have a feeling and an atmosphere but I, but then I, I'm, I was thinking and it's I, like almost challenging him in a way it's like but what is the black metal feeling what is the black metal atmosphere and then we we both ended up thinking like the only way we're really going to figure this out is if we get like brain scans of people and like wavelengths and stuff and see if, like certain hertz was like different shapes and patterns and if that resonates with someone in a certain way and um, I don't know I think that could be a very very interesting study um, which is like the the effects and well the true scientific understandings of feeling and atmosphere in black metal and extreme music mm. kind of well, like really kind of big, figure it out but I, I find that actually nature in black metal um is part of the of the I mean um in was of Anna by Emperor. Yeah. You forget that the Judas Priest rip of uh, the Dragon in the but when it kind of da -da 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 and then you imagine the snow, the forest, the mountains, and it's all there in the music. Hmm. That is black. I had this conversation with uh, Marg of two that he lives <laughs> also far away from here luckily and we were like what what is the kind of quintessential quintessential difficult yeah. word for a non-native english speaker there um black metal kind of landscape like, no but it has this no forest mountains yeah that, that's all you need for black metal but if it's not there um then it feels different immediately. Mm. I hear a lot of Ameritech. I mean, uh, there's this one, Wolves in the Throne Room, for instance. When I listen, I haven't listened to them in a long time, but there was this Two Hunters album with the vastness and the sorrow. That was a very good song. And when I listened to that, I got this forest feeling. Mm. I describe but i got this forest feeling and then i listened to something else and i was like yeah but this sounds like concrete this sounds like city this sounds like you know it doesn't give me the the, the nature that should be there for it to be black metal uh, and and it makes most likely no sense in a logical way but uh, it's the same with folk music also, um, unsurprisingly, I love throat singing and I have, uh, have uh, been, been, that's one of the things I learn, learned and was exposed to when I studied folk music was exactly that. And, and I've been lucky enough to collaborate with some, some people from Mongolia and further in that are very good at this. And they always say that, no, but it's, it's about the landscape. You, you can sing as low as you fucking want to, but, but that is mountain. So unless you think mountain, no, there's not going to be anything there. It's just going to be some, some dude rumbling and croaking all he can, but, but there's no mountain there. And then it's not Karira. And uh, that made sense to me in, in very many ways. And it's the same for me with black metal. Is that it, there is this landscape doesn't necessarily have to be a physical landscape, it can be a landscape of the soul, but it still has to be there. 
that's really really interesting because um that things are just a lot more clear now because it makes you think of like good black metal makes you think of pictures in mm. a way it makes you think of uh things because um i was chatting to tobias of dark space and uh paysage de Vere, and, and he was saying that with a paysage de Vere for, for especially it's all about like pictures and a cold landscape and and a wonder in the cold landscape and taking the listener on this kind of journey and stuff and with dark space it's like like the emptiness and the nothingness of space and like you're in the spaceship kind of thing and that just that just really really cleared things up like black metal good black metal makes you think of pictures mm -hmm. and, and 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 the atmosphere is part of the picture because the 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 music makes you think of a landscape mm -hmm. makes you think of something more and mm -hmm. um, that kind of really makes sense now because um with them um, well if we take hellfire for example you've got like the pictures of just world chaos like a meteor hitting the earth or something like that mm. something mm. very very you know brimstone and ash yeah it's um it, <laughs> yeah. it, it is hellfire that that album yeah very, very much so kind of uh, the song the song itself has this kind of sadness and also this oppressive feeling to it that's um <laughs> you know it is um it's um you know it, it is um it is a almost spiritual thing it's um uh, weird to talk about that and uh, 20, 20 year old me would not have been talking about that in any way, anyway but uh, we allow ourselves stuff when we upgrade Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. And it's, um, no, it's super cool. Like that's kind of just made like so many things in my head just click and it's just like, ah, everything makes sense now. You know, <laughs> going back to 1349, um, when's the new album? <laughs> um, I don't really know if I'm supposed to say this yet. So, uh, but this year, absolutely. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And um, there will be a single long before that. So no worries. Okay, cool. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask too much, too many questions then. Cause I want, I want the surprise. Yeah. You, you'll uh, get some surprises. No worries. It's, um, it was one very rough Saturday in December that I did all the bass for that. And, um, but it's, um, it has the spirit. The spirit is very much there. Okay, excellent, excellent. No, that's um, <laughs> perfect. No, no, because that's the. I don't want any spoilers. That's why. And um, enjoy it. I think it's um, <laughs> thirty forty nine in good form. Excellent. Good. That's all. That's all I can ask for. Because um, yeah, it's been like five years since the um, infernal pathway. It'll be five years this year, and. Yeah. I remember listening to the Infernal Pathway, and there's so there's so much more now, in in 1349's writing, so especially on that album because there's, like, you know, with with Dodds Camp, for example, we're talking about like this kind of Jimi Hendrix kind of like style of intro, and this new album. How much have you contributed to the writing? I wrote um, there's one song that I contributed. Is it three riffs or something? Um, I did no lyrics this time around. Um, the thing here is that um, since 2000, well, since uh, let's say 2019 to 2020, I was very deep in the Swag Lotus album. And then COVID happened, um, because I have demos on my computer of that Swart Lotus album from 2020, when it's 10 songs and it's ready. And then I have demos from 2021, when it's 10 songs and it's ready, but it's not the same. And then I have studio recordings from 2021, where it's 
eight songs and they're not quite ready and then we have the album out now where it's seven songs and an intro and uh, I went so deep into that album that a lot of other things kind of just passed me by and I mean also I was stuck kind of I lived three hours away from Oslo so during Covid I think it was one year I didn't see other guys in the recording line um, like we were we were apart for I mean it was only contact by email and whatever you yeah, know we didn't see each other we didn't think Covid kind of everything slowed down everything went quiet and I sat here and did my own shit and wrote and rewrote and re recorded and did the whole Smart Lotus album to the death. So it was a very, very big relief to kind of let that album out into the world now and kind of, I mean, it, it was done kind of more or less just done right before we started the um, <laughs> the new 349 album, so I kind of had time to jump in and get some riffs going. But, um, but yeah, it was a process. So, But uh, RK on is doing, doing his thing and he's doing it well, so it's... Um... <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'm super, I'm really, really excited to hear um, new 1349. Um, I'm always excited to hear um, <laughs> new 1349. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that that's um no that that's great. And are you guys planning on any? Are you guys planning on any UK shows? The well, thing is, we're going to the US in May now, and then there's some festivals in the summer. We're going to do Europe in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, so the UK is most likely going to be in next year then because of you guys with the Brexit and everything, so we need visas and stuff to get there. And so that uh, makes the process a little bit... I mean, usually if we were doing Europe, we would, you know, pop by, but now, uh, now it's a bit more of a process. But um, we enjoy playing in the UK, so we'll definitely come back. Oh, for sure. Like, I've been at every single uh, London 1349 show since 2011, anyway. You know, we actually, you know, we actually played um, Incineration Festival 2017 together. Oh, All nice. right, yeah. yeah. So, um, no, that was um, that was. Remember that thing, but, uh... What's that? I vaguely remember playing Incin Incineration Fest, but. Uh, yeah. oh, that, that was I the one with festivals, so they they all blend together. But I, I remember being at that festival. Gotcha. Because um, I remember um, you got sect them on on um, second guitars for that as well, and um, was that funny? Okay, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. No, that was a that was a really cool show. And then there was the next show you did in London, which was the uh, the Islington Academy just before lockdown. Yeah, with the was that the the, the Abbott. Abbott. no Abbott, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a that was. Oh god, that was such an amazing show, man! Like it was just after Infernal Pathway came out, and it was just, oh yeah, man! It just just hit the spot. We were we were in good shape, and um, yeah, that was a good tour actually with the Ultimas and the um, South American uh, buddies. Oh, uh, Nuclear, of course. Yeah, that's the one. Great, the great guys playing proper, you know, proper South American trash. Yeah. And every yeah, every band on the bill was was with yeah, it. Yeah, it was so bad about this. It was he was in proper shape. Oh yeah, yeah, that was um, that was amazing. When you finished off with uh, Abyssos and Antithesis, um, just that ending was just so cool. Just yeah, man. Yeah, that was that was that was a good good song to end kind of a show with because it kind of winds. It escalates and then it winds down. Mm. It's nice, a ending, and then you're, <laughs> and then of course the outro, which is the um, woman in the radiator scene from David Lynch's Eraserhead.
you know, David Lynch has, has meant a lot for 1349. Um, in many, many ways, we, the dream is, of course, if that guy would make a music video for us, that would never happen, of course, but if it would, I mean, that would most likely be. Yeah, David Lynch, if you're watching, fucking make a video for 1349. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, man. <laughs> we're, we're up. <laughs> We're poor Norwegians, but we're up. <laughs> no worries. Going back to like ending, uh, ending shows, uh, Atomic Chapel. Why is it that you guys play that at the end? Because it's at the beginning of the one. You yeah, know, it's uh, it has to do with um, the set as a whole, and not uh, usually it's one of the only songs we play from the Monoir. Mm. It it is. Um, you need to be ready for Atomic Chat because there's a lot of really crazy shit happening in that song where it escalates. It, it, you kind of get to warm up during the long, long, slow nodding your head parts and then it kind of explodes into craziness. And then it's just the never ending blast that is the ending. So, so it is a song that needs to be late in the set. You can't open with that shit. I see. Is there any is there any thirteen forty nine song where all of you guys are like, shit? What if we add this in the set? We're just literally just gonna die. No, not on its own. But there's um, there's combinations, right? That's um, if we did uh, Celestial Deconstruction when I was flesh. And stuff like that, back to back, that would <laughs> literally kill us all, yes. I mean, we have to do, um, or we have been doing lately, we have you open with Sculptor, hmm. we go straight into Slaves, and then through Ice of Stone as a kind of triple crash treat. Yeah. And, and that works, but it's, it wakes you up, and then you can do something you know, a bit. Uh, oh, sure. For oh, sure. There was, oh yeah, so um, when uh, speaking to Shalva, he mentioned that you really like Necrohotalanetum as as a song. Why, why is it that you enjoyed that one uh, more specifically to play, like back in the day? Well, I wrote that one again. It's me and Narkeon, but I wrote most of the riffs on that one, and I wrote the lyrics of that one, and it has one of my, uh, one of the things I like doing uh, a lot for some reason when I play guitar, which is bending. And with the uh, bend riff. It's a D and a D sharp, I guess. Oh. Yeah. But I, I liked it. Yeah. I, I used that in um, Sommet Wund Or. There's this. Oh, yeah. I like bending. It's, and then uh, there's also the. Um... Oh. In Satanic. Yep, that's. I like bending. Bending the G, it's. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's. It's just that, that kind of like rock and roll flash kind of thing. So it's the blues. So <laughs> it's needed. Would you guys bring back um, Satanic Propaganda for the live set? Yeah, it's a good song. Yeah. You should, um, I mean, you yeah, know, actually, it's uh, it's more than 20 years since Liberation now, so we can't do the Liberation thing. I mean, it's 20 years since uh, Beyond the Apocalypse now, so maybe we should do that, but. Yes, yeah. it's twenty years since Hellfire, so maybe we should do that. But uh... yeah, because I know, because yeah, I, like I know that people will enjoy um, Satanic Propaganda live, 
Evil Oath, Legion. Um, Riders is always a great live song. That's a, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, Riders has my favorite riff ever. And it's a Shalva riff. And it's the, it's the end riff, the fucking end riff. <laughs> And it's just, yes. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> and I remember um, listening to the demo, and that riff was in there as well. And I was like, ah, <laughs> because because mm-hmm. um, he was saying like, um, you you guys basically had your um, first two demos and tore them apart and used some of the riffs for uh, liberation. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, respect that. I think those would be cool. Um, from beyond the apocalypse. Um, Singer of strange songs, yeah. Eternal Winter. Yeah, I don't think we have ever played the singer. We have played that's uh, that's a uh, that's a good song to play live. Uh, Internal mm-hmm. Winter. I don't even think we have ever played that live. That's uh, a great one. Yeah, no, that that is a good one. We have this um, jam part towards the end where it's uh, we trade solos, all of oh, us yeah. noodling. All the yeah. guitars on the bass and everyone is just, uh, you know. Yeah. And of course, the blade is also one. Of, that was that song is so old. I mean. Yeah, that was like the jam song. Dun, 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 dun. Bam, bam, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, man, that's we've been jamming that song for forever. Mm. It's, and, it's the oldest turning for the non song there is. It's that song. It's, um, yeah. It's a nice one. It's a nice one. And um, I guess from Hellfire, like, I'd, I haven't heard you guys play Celestial Deconstruction live. So I would like that as well. Slaves to Slaughter mm-hmm. as well. That would be a cool one. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah. A Russian bomb as well. Because yeah. that's one of those, like, big fuck you kind of endings. <laughs> this, this madness. Oh, yeah. that. The hyper yeah, block. That's uh, <laughs> that's um, no. We have played all all those songs live. Uh, we we did uh, back in 2015. We did this mm-hmm. anniversary ten year gig where we played the whole thing, mm-hmm. uh, where I realized uh, we had never played from the deeps live, and <laughs> and uh, I had to remember how the, that song went. That was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I wish I was there for the um, the uh, Hellfire tenth anniversary, but um, well, next year it's twenty, so then <laughs> we'll see what happens then. <laughs> Please, <laughs> Mortem has Hellhammer on drums, and Thirteen Forty Nine has Frost on drums. So, what's the difference between playing with both drummers? Um, <laughs> yeah, man. Um... There's so many differences, and the, the, the similarities is that they are both uh, ridiculously good drummers. Um, so, uh, <laughs> they're both ridiculously good drummers, they're both, um, you just kind of have to hang on <laughs> and just be there. and. Um, shape up, get your shit going and just get along with them. I mean, um, um, in terms of differences, I mean, Frost does the thing where it's blasting for minutes straight without any markings or anything, so you just have to dig in and hope for the best, uh, while Hellhammer is a bit more all over the place. Um, very technical, very not always remembering what was going on the last time he did that. Very innovative, you could say, in many ways. That um, just that he played just because he played something last time doesn't necessarily mean that that will be the thing we'll be playing now. So um, both kind of keep you on your toes in in different ways. Um, of course, live with Mortem, we haven't had Hellhammer for a while. 
We've actually we used the, the Swart Lotus drummer in these days for for live shows because uh, and Lammer is of course busy with <laughs> everything else. Okay. Then I said I have a drummer I trust with my life and my playing, so I'm going to bring him in. And if you <laughs> if you guys don't believe me, give me one rehearsal, and that's all all that was needed. So. Yeah, because the Swart Lotus drummer is bloody good. Yes, I'd be good. <laughs> everyone in that band, um, or um, I mean, it's I started Swart Lotus just me and the twelve string acoustic guitar to do Diablo music, and then I met that drummer kid by chance, and then I was like, okay, I need to do a band. And then he had this bass player from his other band, and I'm, yeah, well, bring him along, and then I had this guitarist who's a technical wonder so so all, all the guys in in Ford Lotus are very very good and uh, that's um, that's a that's a blessing in a way because I can be I can then be the guy who comes with all the ideas and comes with them not always perfectly rehearsed stuff and then together as a band um, they we they make me better right um as i said earlier that i don't play the bass in smart locus i don't even make bass lines in smart locus i i trust trust that he will he will do what's needed and he always does he makes cool bass lines and i keep on making guitars that will kind of inspire him to make uh, cool bass lines to give room for the bass Remember that guitarists out there, you can give room for your best player and he might surprise you doing interesting stuff. Just, exactly, yeah. <laughs> just a um, thing out there. 100%. And um, are there going to be any live Svart Lotus shows? Oh yes, I would very much like that to happen. It's, um, it's um, <laughs> just that right now 3049 is doing a lot, but, um, mm. but again, People out there, if you, if you want Swart Lotus, you, you just let us know and um, we want to play and we rehearse and uh, we do good live shows. I mean, I take a certain pride in, um, we, we have played a lot of shows in Norway, we unfortunately haven't really played outside of Norway yet, which is sad. Uh, because Norway is after all Norway, it's, um, it's not... Uh, <laughs> Despite um, all the black metal bands, it's not really a, a place for black metal bands to play live. It's um, we have done a lot of gigs here, two very good kind of receptions, and we really have this. Uh, Swart Lotus live is uh, <laughs> ridiculously much more aggressive than the albums are kind of a thoughtful affair with a lot of layers and I can't of course do all the all the guitar voices and the harmonies and all the Ebo stuff and so so we we up the aggression a bit more and and it's um, uh, again this progressive word that I don't like to throw around so much but uh, but there's stuff happening and, and we have fun and it shines through and um, it's a bit you know I, I get to do do me and and that was the i mean i've been playing live for many many years and um, first time i was going to play live with Swart Lotus, i was insanely nervous and i was sitting kind of backstage before so like what is this feeling because i couldn't remember the last time i had that feeling with Dirty 49, you spend an hour getting the paint on, getting the get up on, getting into destroy everything mode. So there's no room for being nervous or thinking about anything. You just go out there and do your thing. But here it was like, oh, it's it's going to be this this mug. People are going to look at now, and um, and that was a very. <laughs> To begin with, it was a very difficult feeling, but uh, as I kind of rose to the occasion, it really 
it really felt good and it really made me want to do much much more of that so so with smart lotus i would like to play live as much as humanly possible um because it gives me a chance to express something else and do something else i mean it is <laughs> it is a very different side of me than 1349 of course but but it is still something that i'm I have grown very comfortable in, in expressing and it gets other sides of me out than just this <laughs> ridiculous aggression side that gets out in 1349. Um, there's a bit more room for the introspective and the melodic and the, um, yeah. <laughs> the beautiful to be a bit pompous about it. There, there, there's so much more in, in, in Swart Lotus in a way because it, it's a full spectrum sort of thing. It's, I can do weird, I can listen to Cool on the Gang for weeks and then suddenly, oh, I have this riff, it's funky. Let's turn that into a black metal song. And my bandmates were hating me easily for a year for, <laughs> for that riff, but now that it's there and the song is there, they're like, that's a fucking great song. I'm like, yeah, it is, but it, this, um, let's see if I can get, <laughs> get the song out there doing this. Uh, that riff. Oh, I recognize it. Um... About. Yeah. What what album is that from again? That's uh, Cryptic Light from the from the latest Smart Lotus from Summit One Pod. Gotcha. Next to the last song, then the one that starts. A bit of disharmony, I'm always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the, it's the death metal song on that album that for some reason turns into a funk song at the end. <laughs> no, I love that shit though. I, I love having songs that just have that moment where it kind of just changes completely. Um, I guess like um, Ascending by P Pantheon Eye is, is an example because you've got this like, uh, you've got this really beautiful intro and then it gets like all evil and then it fades into like the beautiful again but it makes the beautiful parts make the evil bits more evil and then in that situation you've got like the riffy bits make a bit feel more riffy because you've got the funky bits mm, yeah um, no, it's the contrast um... that's it yeah the contrast and um if we take i guess towers upon towers could be um an example in terms of, like the riff style because um You've got this uh, single pick note, -na -na, -na -na, -na -na. and then in the middle of the song, you've got like one of the bounciest and grooviest riffs ever. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it just makes the groovy bits more groovy, and then you've got the um, that foreboding riff. <laughs> uh, all the good stuff are you um are you going to be um playing towers uh any live shows soon um who knows um it's not on the set list for the us as far as i know the thing the thing about um Infernal Pathway is that COVID kind of did a number on that one. So, so I mean, by the time we go out again, then it's going to be a new album. So who knows if Towers... Mm. I mean, usually every song sneaks its way into the set list at some point sooner or later, but uh, usually it's uh, from from that. It's Stutz Camp, of course, uh, Stands All in Fire, we are playing live. Uh, Abyssos, of course, um, Rise of Storm, 
and um, the, uh, the, the other one, um, Rising the Chasm. So of course, that's um, that's of course a good one to play live. Yeah. Um, you know, there's <laughs> there's so many songs. It's eight albums soon. Yeah. Soon eight albums. So I mean. <laughs> Oh, it's great, it's great. <laughs> You're having fun, man. There's going to be a live album. Oh, wicked. Uh, because we did record this, uh, or it's if it's going to be a live... I guess people don't do DVDs anymore, so it's Blu-ray or whatever, or whatever else it is now. Uh, because we did the show in Oslo that was filmed in its entirety, and I think we're releasing that. Epic. I'm not 100% sure when and how and what and all that, but that's going to happen, yeah. No, because I've got your um, your first DVD, uh, Havelica... Havelica Fire. Havelica, that's the one, the one with your 2005 show. Yeah, uh, yeah that's... that's... It's so raw. <laughs> it's so mean. <laughs> it's so mean. And I remember now, um, there was going to be a question about Dotskamp because um, you wrote the lyrics for that, didn't you? Yeah, me and RK. Um, the thing was that um, this um, the Monk project thing happened and uh, they asked us. And the soon the second I heard, oh, we're going to do a Munk song, then I started writing lyrics. And before I had seen the painting, most of my part of the lyrics were done. Because just by thinking about Munk and this automatic writing sort of thing. And then me, Arkham and me went to the museum to see the scamp. And then the rest kind of came to me and then Arkeon had written the, the kind of chorus parts and, and uh, then he sent me his parts and I sent him my, my parts and then we kind of just this <laughs> this is how that song must be and that song I'm very 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 happy with that it it has this bit atypical 1349 vibe with the folky and Rex glam bits, yeah. but also this very strict drum, 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 chugging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, let's see. Just, uh... And the um, yeah, yeah, no, that's a good um, and then the <laughs> escalation last bit sports after that, so of course, um, yeah, yeah, no, man, that's a uh... great, great song. It's um, it's just got so much heart, so much like soul in that song, it's it's so alive in a way. Yeah, no, it, it, it really has this, um, you know, I, I think Orkeo was very inspired by this, um, by the painting, because it is, a, it is a very powerful painting, and I mean, it, it is, um, there's so much expression in it, in very small, very, I mean, the, the, a lot of the faces are, you don't really see any expressions, but, but the kind of, the postures and the, it is very strong, very powerful, and when you see it, it's massive, the painting itself is massive, so when you see it, you're like, okay, that's some proper art. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was cool, that was, um, <laughs> fun, fun to do something like that uh, as a kind of, it felt for a second like some sort of recognition from the Norwegian state that hey, maybe you said more shapers can be used for something. So who did the Svart Lotus logo? 
Oh, um, let's see if I can get the camera going there. Here is the original made by my buddy Danny Larsen, who is a Norwegian artist. I was in a, a groove metal, is what the kids call it, band called Dead Trooper for a little while. And um, they went to school with Danny. He, he used to be a professional snowboarder. And we were drinking and um, having fun, and uh, we got along really well. And uh, I, he had a atelier studio, kind of uh, very close to where 3049 rehearsed. So I will usually, when I went to Oslo, I would drop by and have a cup of coffee with him at his studio. And um, that's kind of when when I saw one of his drawings, this um, that's the cover of the Smart Lotus EP. Um, that when I saw that, I thought, like, okay, this 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 makes things clear. Like, can I use this for something? And he's like, yeah, sure, buddy, you can you can use that. And then. Later when I had that, I, I think the band is going to be called Swart Lotus. I like, oh yeah, no, I, I'll fix the logo. I got you, buddy. And um, as you see, it's it's a lot yeah. of flower, right? But he said that I know you, so if you flip it around... <laughs> That's beautiful. No, because it's, it's such a well done logo. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, Glorious! It's fantastic, and uh, yeah. so so happy about that. Um, that logo, I had to go get it tattooed on my hand as soon as I could, uh, you know. And um, he's such. I mean, he did um, for Stemmer for Deep the first album, Thra Deep actually. Uh, I I asked him, can you do? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> like, do you want to hear that? One? Nah, I know you. <laughs> and then when the album says, yeah, yeah, here it is, I was like, it's perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But um, when the time came around for this new album, then unfortunately, <laughs> I couldn't afford his services anymore. He's a very successful artist. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, money speaking, I'm not, so uh, I couldn't afford that of his artwork anymore, unfortunately. But. Uh, Luckily, I had a different cover in mind. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for, yeah. And, and I mean, the way this new album went uh, with Zart Lotus. The, because I saw this, the cover photo, which is from some old uh, 1920s black and white movie called Dr. Mabuse Der Spieler, which is a four hour, very artistic black and white movie. It's um, it's rough to get through, but it's worth it. But I saw that photo and I was like, this is perfect for an album cover, but uh, it needs to be some doomy, gloomy shit. And at the moment, Talk Lotus this awesome wasn't that. But by the time the album was done, I was like, yeah, but now, now this is the perfect cover. Let's go. Yeah, it works because it's got this kind of like evil dealings kind of vibe. And mm. it just it just works for the music. Yeah, no, it's... Um... Re really happy about it. it. It is really this weird, strange, a bit occult, um, a bit goofy, but um, but serious kind of. It works. It has this feeling to it that the whole album has, um, which wasn't necessarily there when I started writing it, but was the end result is that it is this very doomy album in my device it has this a bit down from alienation vibe to it that it's it's a bit strange it's not totally off this world which is how i feel quite often so no i get you no that's all good and and the last question is um what advice do you have for uh musicians nowadays and people who want to pick up bass <laughs> Those are two a bit different questions. Well, but for for musicians, I'm not the right guy to give uh, advice because, well, I can give general advice like practice, learn your stuff. It's it's 
2024. So we we could get away with not being very great musicians back in the 90s because we were, you know, we were doing something relatively new and uh, and the English had something you could still get away with the feeling and then we got better as time progressed. But now things are different. You have to have to have your shift in order because the competition is much steeper. But don't forget the feeling. I think I've said this many times during the interview that the feeling, you have to have the feeling and the identity that think about what you can offer, what, what is what is inside you and that's what needs to come out. Don't think too much about what's that, that guy doing, what's that guy doing, what's what this old grey beard on YouTube telling me. Think about what's inside here and particularly in the heart and try to, I mean, yeah, of course, every day of your career you have to sit there and you have to do the you have to do the scales, you have to learn to do the, do the motions, do the... all that shit. But ho however many times you play the... It's not gonna mean anything unless you put your, your heart in it and you put your feelings in it. So it becomes something more than just... So suddenly it's something more than just the scale, right? It's um, put put your heart in there. That's um, that's gonna make it better to listen to for everyone. Yeah, I think that's uh, <laughs> that's the best advice I can. Give. Oh yeah, never give up. Never care and give a shit about what other people say. Who cares? You have to do what's right for you. Follow that thing inside there and just. Go for it, but practice, 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 practice. Hang in the garage and suck with all your and suck and practice, practice until it's great. Always play with people. Don't be afraid of playing with people. Don't be afraid of playing stuff that's a bit outside your comfort zone. Don't be afraid of playing something you don't necessarily like or something that's kind of everything is practice in a way all sorts of music even if you're never gonna want to play you know tango or whatever but if you know how to play it you're not losing anything